the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the church which will not endure sound doctrine having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training and many have invited new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Winston Peel and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the apostate church of the book of Revelation. Hello and welcome to a new video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one's called Peace and Evangelization 2000 and as you probably suspect from the title, this deals with chapter 18 of the current book reading I'm doing, All Roads Lead to Rome, the Ecumenical Movement by Michael Dissemlian. It is chapter 18 that we have arrived on in this book. And the title of this chapter is, as I said, Peace and Evangelization 2000. The problem that I have with a title like this as a Bible-believing Christian is very simple. Peace is one thing that we will not find on this earth, as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ told us. And Evangelization 2000, evangelization anyway, does not go hand in hand with peace especially peace between so-called Christians. Because and evangelization meant here is nothing else than ecumenical movement. And ecumenical movement, as we have learned already, I think, during the reading of this book, is nothing else but for everybody who has another belief than the Roman Catholic Church is to make compromises to come back under the wings of the Roman Catholic Church so that there will be a one world religion. Peace and evangelization don't go together. The chapter starts on page 187. On the page before there is a nice picture that you will probably see in the video here also from the uh, Reverend David Shepherd, Anglican Bishop of Liverpool and the Most Reverend Derek Warlock. Roman Catholic Archbishop who wrote a book together which is called Better Together. <laughs> well, they can maybe call it Better Together in Anglican and in Roman Catholic and I say Better Apart. But that's of course only my view as a Bible-believing Christian. Anyway, let's start reading on page 187, chapter 18, Peace and Evangelization 2000. The theme of peace comes up with frequent consistency. <laughs> A growing worldwide consensus sees that Pope John Paul II has emerged as the great peacemaker of our day and people are looking with renewed hope toward Rome for peace and th uh, through unity. For peace through unity. Yeah. What does the Bible say about that? When they say peace and what was it? We can read that in First Thessalonians 5 verse 3. 
For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. That is the world that we are living in. They say peace and they make peace with so-called unity, with so-called ecumenism. And that actually means destruction, because it means destruction of your soul, because you leave the small path that leads to Jesus Christ. Anyway, the author continues, this is the man, Pope John Paul II, eh? who can bring the once conflicting religions and ideologies of the world together, and more and more Christians are being convinced that he will do so under the banner of Christ. It seems likely they will be disappointed. It is Mary, the mother of God, who has spoken to the Pope about peace. Through her many appearances at Fatima, Medjugorje and elsewhere, she, the Queen of Peace, or Queen of Heaven, I add here, is continually promising peace through prayer and through prayer and fasting and the faithful practice of the rosary and the pursuit of the sacraments. So there is this idol of the Roman Catholic Church, the so called Mother Mary, the Queen of Peace, the Queen of Heaven, continually promising, continually promising, never fulfilling, but continually promising peace through prayer and fasting and the faithful practice of the rosary? Where do you have the practice of the rosary in the Bible? I think maybe we can connect that when Jesus said that don't uh, do that we should not pray as the heathens do and don't do repetitious prayers, contemplative prayers, because the rosary is nothing else than that. And you know that in the rosary Mary is mentioned, but Jesus is not mentioned. And the pursuit of the sacraments, well, okay, the Bible only has two. The Roman Catholic Church has seven. So, are you following the traditions of men, or are you following the word of God? The Bible warns again and again of the false peace that the Antichrist will bring. So, the author makes my point even with two quotes from the Bible. The first one, read in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 10, quote, Because... Even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace. Unquote. And in Luke chapter 12, verse 51, we read, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you, nay, but rather division. Unquote. This was our Lord Jesus Christ speaking. We are instructed to pray for peace of Jerusalem. The peace that the Lord has promised will come only when He comes. There will be no peace in this materialistic antichrist system and world. There will only be peace when the real Prince of Peace comes, and that is Jesus Christ in His second coming. Under the direction of Lutheran minister and charismatic leader Harold Bredesen, friend and spiritual mentor of CBN's Pat Robertson, plans were made and publicly proclaimed for Pope John Paul II to be presented with the Prince of Peace Prize for all the world's leaders in Washington in 1990 to lead into the decade of evangelization. Now what did I just read? For Pope Antichrist Pope John Paul II to be presented with the Prince of Peace Prize. Another proof that you see that the Pope takes the title that belongs to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, not the Pope. And he wants the Peace Prize, the Prince of Peace Prize? Yeah. He, the Antichrist, is responsible for all the wars. However, finally it didn't happen. It may simply have been a testing of reaction on something highly controversial. If so, it's only a matter of time before it actually does take place. The reaction was sadly very muted. The only previous awarding of this prize in 1980 was to Anwar Sadat of Egypt, who was assassinated very soon afterwards. Prince of Peace is proposed as yet another title given to 
the Holy Father. In the scriptures, this title belongs only to our Lord Jesus Christ, and its usurping is profoundly shocking to Christians who regard the use by any man of either title as blasphemous. It is also instructive to recall that Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie did not live long after he proclaimed himself Lion of Judah. A definition of blasphemy has been given by the Protestant Truth Society. Quote, blasphemy in scripture means not so much speaking against God as the assumption of divine attributes or divine power where no rightful claim exists. Unquote. Much respected Roman Catholics such as Mother Teresa of Calcutta and Polish President Lech Walesa are being used by the Vatican to promote the peace theme and behind it the plan to evangelize the earth. Both, like the Dalai Lama, have been awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. I think you have to absolutely be a Catholic to win a peace prize, right? <laughs> And Mother Teresa was a devilish woman. Now the next part in this uh, chapter is called The Decade and Growing Global Momentum. The Decade and Growing Global Momentum. Well, we are speaking about the 90s, the 1990s of the last century, of course. And uh, it all leads up to what the chapter is called, Evangelization 2000. Huh? Momentum for the decade is building up as part of the interchurch process with the merger of Roman Catholic and Anglican initiatives. This merger, which inevitably offers what United Protestant Council Secretary Anglican John Scherer has described as no gospel at all, has the blessing of the leadership of the main denominations. No gospel at all. When you merge with the Roman Catholic Church, you have no true gospel at all. That's right. A letter to the Eastern Daily Press in Suffolk illustrated how the merger of the Protestant and Catholic initiatives is taking place. The letter, signed by Anglican Bishop of Norwich and the Roman Catholic Bishop of East Anglia, called for prayer for the, quote, ten-year program of deepening, widening and sharing our faith known as the Decade of, the ev of Evangelism or the Decade of Evangelization." Unquote. The Decade of Evangelization, known as Evangelization 2000, was launched in Britain alongside the Decade of Evangelism and on the same day, the 6th of January 1991. Officially blessed at John Paul II's private Mass on 23rd of June 1987, Evangelization 2000 reaches its climax on Christmas Day in the year 2000 when the Pope hopes to speak to 5 billion people in one worldwide satellite broadcast. At the time of the writing of this book, this of course still was future. And I don't know if it really took place in that way, speaking to 5 billion people via satellite broadcast, but I don't think that it's even possible to reach 5 billion. But anyway, he probably reached many. Father Tom Forrest has declared that the objective of the decade of evangelization is to give Jesus Christ a 2000th birthday present of a m world more Christian than not. The Church of England and Free Church denominations have not been so unbiblically specific about prospective conversions, but have declared the aim to fulfill the Great Commission to preach the gospel to all the world as we can read in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. But the only problem is that we have to ask ourselves, which gospel are they preaching to all the world? Huh? The campaign is highly structured with key Vatican departments involved and most countries have a national service committee reporting to the Vatican. Tom Forrest heads the office in Rome alongside fellow American Ken Mertz, head of the International Catholic Charismatic Renewal Office. But as Forrest said in 1989, pointing to the weighty back of the, uh, of the project, everything is now receiving guidance from Secretary of State Cardinal Agostino Casaroli and from the Vatican Secretariat of 
Christian unity. Gatherings like, like Acts 86, the 1987 Congress in New Orleans, 1988 in Chicago, Berlin and Washington for Jesus in 1990 in Indianapolis and in Bern through other charismatic leaders like John Wimber, Bob Mumford, Larry Christensen, Vincent Sinan and Michael Harper have given the Vatican the same message that they are united with Roman Catholics in the plan to evangelize the world. United with the beast. They have also given considerable impetus to the launch of Evangelization 2000 among Pentecostals and Charismatics. Brighton 91 That the world may believe, which took place in July 1991, was described by its organizers who included Chairman Michael Harper, Dr. Vincent Sinan, Larry Christensen, Father Tom Forrest and fellow Roman Catholic Mrs. Kim Collins and being able to provide the greatest potential today for achieving the target of reaching the world through this coming decade. Pastor Ron Smith of the Kent-based Fishers Fellowship expressed the deep concern of many evangelicals that the euphoria of it all would break down any barriers of reservations some might have. Quote, I believe, he wrote in 1991, in the January of 1991, that at Brighton there will be unity of heart and emotions. The worship group will ensure this. There will be sincere fervor as delegates sing, Jesus is Lord. Some will hold hands, sway, fall down or dance. There will be genuine tears of joy as some fellowship with those with whom they have never done so before. It will not, however, constitute a unity in the gospel. It will be the kind of emotional unity that is expressed at the last night of the proms as thousands sing, land of hope and glory. Unquote. It's all make up. It's nothing true. Large numbers of the world's evangelical leaders attended Lausanne, 1989, that's in Switzerland, the second international congress on world evangelization. The conference, which took place in Manila in July 1989, according to its program, quote, sought to coordinate a plethora of strategies which have been formulated to evangelize the world by the year 2000 AD, unquote. The first Lausanne Congress in 1974 invited five WCC leaders, that's World Council of Churches, and three Roman Catholic priests as observers. Although the Roman Catholic Church is not one of the 317 member churches of the World Council of Churches, no, why is the Roman Catholic Church not part of the World Council of Churches. Go back to the beginning of the reading of this book if you want to know. I cannot fall into repetition. But it is the same policy that the Roman Catholic Church follows on the United Nations. She is not a full member of the United Nations, but she is outside of the United Nations. The Holy See, that is. The Vatican, that is what I mean. Because they cannot be entangled in the quarrels within. They stand outside of that. And with the World Council of Churches is exactly the same because the Roman Catholic Church considers herself the Mother Church. And all these 317 members of the uh, World Council of Churches are all apostate daughters that have to go back to the Mother Harlot. So therefore the Mother Harlot cannot be part of the World Council but stands outside because that's where all the ones go back into. But I explained that in the beginning of the reading of this book, so if you missed that, go back to the first chapters and you will probably hear my explanation in there. Anyway, I'm going to repeat the sentence uh, again for continuation's sake. Although the Roman Catholic Church is not one of the 317 member churches of the World Council of Churches, Roman Catholics play a major role in the work of the Council. The World Council of Churches staff are drawn from 89 different member churches, but about 25% belong to just one church, 
the Roman Catholic Church. Moreover, the Vatican appoints 12 of the 120 members of the World Council of Churches Commission on Faith and Order, and sent 23 observers to the recent 7th Assembly in Canberra, Australia, in February 1991. This assembly, with its theme, Come Holy Spirit, Renew the Whole Creation, broke new ground in the promotion of other faiths and one world religion. Next part of this chapter is called Following the Leader. Führer, wir folgen dir. Huh? Like the Germans said in the Third Reich for Hitler. Follow the leader, following the Führer. Huh? Well-known leading Protestants, including Jim Packer and Chuck Colson, write in Christian publications such as the magazine New Covenant, the preeminent periodical of the Catholic renewal. These magazines simultaneously promote aspects of the Catholic faith, including the Rosary, visitations at Magic Gorge and prayers to Mary and the saints, whilst publicizing Evangelization 2000 and the Decade of Evangelization, gathering momentum for this global evangelistic undertaking. John Wimber, a greatly respected and very influential leader among charismatic Christians, has been used in this way. An article by him in the June 1988 edition of New Covenant on Why I Love Mary, arguing that, quote, her faith is a model for our faith, unquote, appeared opposite another article also on Why I Love Mary, in which Mary is portrayed as the mother who answers the prayers of the faithful. As an enthusiastic supporter of ecumenism, John Wimber, who puts special emphasis on signs and wonders in his ministry, has come out strongly in favor of Roman Catholic evangelism. Quote, Since Antichrist... <laughs> Sorry, that's not, that's not in the book. <laughs> okay, the reader quote. Since Pope John XXIII called Vatican II and prayed... Come, Holy Spirit, we need a new Pentecost. There has been an explosion in the Church. Unquote. John Wimber strongly endorsed the ministries of a group of the Old Testament style prophets, centered at Kansas City, the first major ecumenical conference venue of the renewal. These Kansas City prophets were said to have successfully predicted earthquake and drought. They prophesied revival falsely, and with prophecies not limited to scripture, were the cause of major divisions within the charismatic church. Before their leader, Paul Cain, left to join in ministry with Westminster Chapel Pastor R.T. Kendall, they were endorsed at their 1990 introduction in London by Terry Virgo, Roger Forster, Gerald Coates, Lynn Green, Sandy Miller, David Pitches, and other charismatic leaders. The prophets do not have the endorsement of Scripture, because Scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, quote, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things unquote. that means that in this time we do not have any biblical supported prophets anymore something very important i probably have to share with my german brethren when i do the german reading because there are some people who call themselves prophets on youtube channels and you have probably the same also in english but i know of this prophet susanne who is uh, always making comments on my videos in, in, in my german videos calls herself a prophet there are no biblical supported prophets anymore because he has in this last day spoken unto us by his son. Jesus was the last prophet. 
and of course if of course you can only call him a prophet he was much more than a prophet but he was the last one to come and to end that there are no prophets anymore in this world and whoever claims to be a prophet is not biblical vision ad 2000 Remarkable numbers of local churches and fellowships have a vision for growth into the 21st century and are gearing up to participate in ecumenical evangelism in the years ahead. Modern marketing methods are now in and much is communicated to congregations about strategy, planning for growth and vision with numbers targeted for the 1990s. Evangelical organizations are proliferating new brands and trademarks such as Target 2000, Faith 2000, Vision 21st Century, Countdown 2000, Lumen 2000, Mission 2000, Reaching the World 2000 and AD 2000 World Evangelization Movement. The year 2000 is also of great significance to new agers. According to New Age thinking, the vernal equinox pointing now to Pisces, the fish, the age of the church will move by the year 2000 to the age of Aquarius, the water bearer, and the end of strife on earth. The age of Aquarius is another name for the New Age, seen by some observers as yet another elaborate counter-reformation smokescreen to cause God's people to drop their God, to succumb to futurist thinking and look to the future for the Antichrist. Look to the future for the Antichrist. <laughs> ah, yeah, Roman Catholic futurist thinking of the Antichrist is one single person that comes seven years before Jesus Christ comes back. Wrong teaching that has its basis on the writings of Francisco Ribera from 1590. And something else that I want to comment on because this was the last paragraph on the chapter 18 that we've just read called Peace and Evangelization 2000 is in the first sentence of this last chapter it says that um, this new age thinking the vernal equinox pointing now to Pisces the fish age the age of the church will move by the year 2000 to the age of Aquarius the water bearer and end the strife on earth but the comment I want to make is <coughs> that the author writes in correctly, I, I'm not going against the author here, the point is that he writes that the age of Pisces, the fish, is the age of the church. Why do you think, if that is, <laughs> that, that is true, when you think of the day gone fish hat, the Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, is wearing all the time? Is he now starting to wear water barrels as the water bearer because we are in the age of Aquarius? <laughs> no. So that was the ending of the age of Pisces, they say in the New Age. And of course, the author correctly says, a smokescreen to cause God's people to drop their guard, to succumb to a futurist thinking and look to the future for the Antichrist. That is what the author said. So, of course, Michael de Semlian, as me, who is reading and discussing this book, is very much aware of that the papacy is the Antichrist, but this is just another smokescreen with the age of Aquarius to cause God's people to drop their guard and succumb to futurist thinking and teaching of the Roman Catholic Church because when the Roman Catholic Church is not the Antichrist then of course we can unite with the Pope then of course we can unite with the Roman Catholic Church but if he is the Antichrist that's another thing so that's why a new age 
and in evangelization circles, charismatic cir circles, uh, ecumenical circles, of course, never, ever, ever the question of the Antichrist arises and is talked about. The Pope is not the Antichrist for them and according to their teaching. So if he is not the Antichrist, well then there is no reason not to unite. And I agree. But the problem is that he is the Antichrist and therefore it is impossible to unite with the Church of Satan, with the son of perdition with a man of sin, with a little horn, with the Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan. This was chapter 18, very short one, Peace and Evangelization 2000 of the book all roads lead to Rome from Michael de Semlian, and we will continue next time on page 193 in chapter 19, Bible Prophecy and Bible Versions. Very interesting, as the whole book is already. Thank you very much for watching the video, listening, learning, commenting, and even taking up the book by yourself, this book and other books, to educate yourself on really on really who is the Antichrist, what is going on, and how to be saved only by Jesus Christ. There is no other way. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ said, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. Not through Rome, no, through no priest, through no Pope, there is salvation. In no church there is salvation. There is only salvation through grace, by faith in Jesus Christ. Chocolate 66 from Hour of the Truth says God bless you. Signing off. Bye bye. We as Bible believing Christians we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many. And so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about but I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, Take that information in what happens about there. Pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of and that they are just deceived people that they maybe have a chance. By going through this situation, maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way. Maybe they have a way to find to the real truth. I mean, these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called, quote-unquote, Christian countries. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course, the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up 
And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians. And that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbors.